Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to Essential Ingredients. I'm Justine Reichman, your host. And today we have Steve Ritz. Hi, Steve. Hello, Justine. It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. It's been so long. Oy vey. Oy vey. You look exactly the same. Well, a hundred, couple hundred pounds less, I might add, since the last time you saw me live. But it look, it's hard to tell that from here, in all fairness. All I see is from here up. Okay, well, here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're so svelte. 32-inch waist, baby. <laughs> wow. So tough and strong and lean. Yep. I'm eating plants. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, it's really exciting to see you after all this like time. That. And I'm so glad to reconnect. I have such fond memories of uh, TEDx Manhattan and the whole event and meeting you. And it really stuck with me all these years. So it was great to connect with you back on LinkedIn and just hear about what you're up to. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. So, uh, yes, we met at TEDx Manhattan, the talk that I think uh, rocked the world, or <laughs> certainly my world, a million and a half views later. Um, but, you know, who knew? Well, I think some people did know. I certainly had the fortitude and, and, and the will to get it done. But, you know, what is it now? Uh, eight years later, I guess, you know, and we're touching. Is it? I'm it's so a, yeah, it was 2012 or 2000. Yeah, I think 2012. You know, we're now in 500 plus schools, touching 50,000 students a day in 20 states in five nations. We were just given the uh, 2020 Game Changer Award. You know, along the way, I became a top 10 finalist for the Global Teacher Prize, got invited to the Obama White House. Uh, let's be clear, I was asked to work elsewhere several times along the way, and that's okay. It happens to the best of us, but I got a PhD from the State University of New York. So I am a people and plant hugging dude, you know, calling Dr. Ritz, please. So amazing things can happen. And that's the power of good people in this amazing movement that we are all a part of. Steve, can you tell us, so you are in all these schools. What are you doing in all these schools? So I like to say we grow vegetables, our vegetables grow students, our students grow schools, and our schools grow healthy, resilient communities. We've kind of moved from, I guess, the Green Bronx machine model, if you will, has really evolved from an after-school program and somewhat of a workforce development program to a whole school program, K-12 to and beyond. So we have approved curriculum that is Common Core, Next Generation Science Standard, P21, Sustainable Development Goal aligned that is being used by the State University of New York to, uh, to, to, to mentor teachers in whole school instruction. And literally, you know, we have become the all-you-can-eat buffet of Next Generation Science Standard-based whole school instruction. So it is the art and science of growing vegetables aligned to whole school instruction and behavioral outcomes across the country. Wow, and this started as an after-school program, right? It started with me almost falling off the stage at TED. Who is that guy, Ted? Where'd he go? I'm still waiting to meet him. But, you know, it started with a dream. It started with a dream that we could move children and young adults who were apart from success to becoming a part of it in ways that benefit, you know, all of society. And along the way, and that started, you'll remember, with green walls and green roofs and the green economy. And then we learned largely because of you and so many other people in the movement about food. You know, I went from being an ornamental gardener to a vegetable gardener. And literally, you know, we just surpassed 100,000 pounds of vegetables grown with students in the South Bronx. Uh, you know, we have the National Health Wellness and Learning Center at CS55, which uh, was a great TEDx follow-up talk that I gave, by the way, that, you know, has been visited by people from 60 countries and around the world. And uh, it's, you know, it's taken a school that was once the poorest performing school in the least healthy county in all of New York State and the poorest congressional district in America to outperform citywide and statewide norms across New York City and across New York State. So uh, from surviving to thriving, from hope to the Pope, I got invited to meet Pope Francis. And from our little classroom greenhouse to the Obama White House, not once, not twice, but three times. Wow. Yeah. Gosh. So now, what inspired you to, to start this whole movement? I needed a job. No, uh, <laughs> what inspired me is that, you know, you can't go from seed 
to harvest without some nurturing, mm -hmm. without cultivating growth. And, you know, I'm of the mindset that I want to cultivate growth. I want to cultivate, cultivate growth in children. You know, it started literally, you know, with the desire just to see children get jobs, to take children who are hurting themselves, hurting each other and hurting the world to kind of healing it a little bit along, you know, aligned to living wage jobs. And then, you know, I really realized the impact food you you saw, I got bigger and bigger and sicker and sicker, culminating, you know, with a heart attack and all kinds of issues and all kinds of heart, you know, health issues that were all food and diet related. So for me, food is really the most important school supply in the world, mm -hmm. especially if you don't have it. And remarkably, I found myself working in a community where there was very limited access to anything that was really food. Yeah, there's a mess manufactured edible synthet synthetic substances and a whole lot of crap, calorie rich and processed food. But when you teach kids about food, you teach them about life, you teach them about ecosystems, you teach them about a sense of interconnectedness. You teach them that you can't rush growth. You can't go from seed to harvest without cultivation in the middle. And what I love to do is cultivate young minds and cultivate young people and cultivate healthy palates. And here we are now, you know, back then it was jobs. Now we have kids who are aspiring to college. I have a whole class of vegans and little girls who call themselves feminist feminists and don't want to eat animals and want to save water and are boycotting Wendy's because they don't pay farmers enough for their tomatoes. It's awesome sauce. <laughs> wow, that's quite an impact too. Yeah, slowly but surely, you know, but listen, Make no doubt about it. It's one class, it's one student at a time, it's one classroom at a time, it's one school at a time, it's one community at a time. But we did the due diligence to come up with a curriculum that was beta tested across 30,000 students and, and really put in our due diligence to not only be disruptive, but to deliver. And I'm thrilled to say that we are probably one of the most disruptive nonprofits in this space, you know, ranked top 10 health and wellness program in, the, in America by the Harkin Institute and top 100 educational innovations in the world by 100, which is, you know, kind of cool. And again, meeting that first lady, Michelle, she was awesome. <laughs> she was so gracious. I bet. And she was, yeah. she's pretty, you know, she was pretty active in the health and wellness movement as it related to food it was a huge and food. Listen, she got to the White House and said the way we treat our children is indicative of who we are as a nation. And of course, you know, I was just so excited to see President Barack Obama, you know, get elected back in 2008. And then again in 2012. And here we are on the night before what is the election of a lifetime. It's not an election. It's really about a direction. Uh, you can be a racist or you can vote for the righteous. And I'll leave it at that. But, you know, to, to, I was so excited, number one, to see the Obamas get to the White House, given what was going on in America then and what it stood for. And then to hear how she came out so strongly for children and for health and wellness. And then, you know, as she's sitting there and I'm doing all this great work with children and being celebrated by the likes of you and Ted and TEDx and everybody else, to be 300 pounds, you know, I had to be about it. And seven months later, there I was, a champion of change, right back in her White House, you know, presenting. It was kind of cool. So it, it, I certainly give her a lot of credit and to learn that, you know, Bill Yassis and, and she were talking about the work that we were doing, you know, in the South Bronx and to have our children go down there and, and, and be a part of it, you know, to bring children from public housing to the White House multiple times and not only to meet them, but to meet the staff and to cook together and then to have the staff come and cook with us up in the Bronx, you know, that's, that's the promise of America. That's the integrity of purpose. That is the integrity of promise. And I'm hoping tomorrow we reclaim that, but that's what drives me. Yeah, I, I hope I'm with you on tomorrow. All right, so. listen, just please vote, 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 vote like your life depends on it. I agree. Well, when this and comes out, we will see where we are because it's not going to yeah. come out in time. But hopefully by the time it comes out, we'll have a new plan. We'll have a new president in place. And there'll be a new plan for you to go to the White House to be able to integrate some of these great programs <laughs> and uh, plan globally how you can then make this even more robust and expand yeah, further. I hope so. Listen, President Obama was very gracious. He cited our work in National Geographic. We put farms both inside and outside the White House and were invited to South by South Lawn. 
So wow. make no doubt about it. Uh, I think anyone in their right mind will get behind the work we are doing for happier, healthier, higher performing children. And most important, Let's not forget what this is really about is changing the lens of public education because I believe public education is the greatest lever this nation has towards equity and justice. And that's what the food movement really embodies, getting back to the essential ingredients and what this podcast is all about. It's really about justice and food justice is racial justice. And that's the most important thing. It's really about creating, it's one thing to say I'm not a racist. I wanna know how you are actively non-racist in every single thing that you do. That's the most important thing. How do we create and eliminate, how do we eliminate the barriers to justice and to equity? Not just say, oh, I'm not a racist, but you know, it's okay for those people over there to have all that crap in their lives. You know, right, we've gotta yeah. really dismantle the system. Yeah, but I'd, and I'd love to hear more about some of the stories of the kids and how it's really directly impacted them, both as they're learning more about food, but how it's impacting them with their education, with their plans for the future, because it sounds like this is really integral to their development. Well, input equals output. So good food in means you're going to get better behaviors and better functioning out. But we recently did a screening, an online screening for our new documentary called Generation Growth. And we had kids talking online, you know, our students, our present students saying, wow, Mr. Ritz, when I saw the documentary, I realized you tricked me. I thought my job was to grow vegetables, but really you taught us to read and write. <laughs> Similarly, you know, you know, I've been teaching now since 1984. Don't let the youthful good looks and boyish <laughs> personality fool you, Justine. You know, I'm, I'm definitely a card-carrying citizen of that <laughs> crowd. Uh, and I understand that, you know, my time is somewhat limited, but I've had now two and three generations of students who got online and talked about the changes that have been in their lives and even their children's lives. And that to me is heartwarming. We go back into the movie, you see kids who, you know, who I had in the 80s, who are now incredible successes today, largely because someone was willing to give them a chance, just like you were willing to give me a chance. And so many of our friends and in the movie. Versa. Well, yeah, as, and, and, and that's what this is really about. It's about sowing seeds and making sure you cultivate those seeds to a harvest of epic proportions. But let's get granular. What were we talking about in the South Bronx? Well, we're talking about, you know, I, I moved into a school that was slated to be closed. And I saw this school was a great place to build an urban farm. I love the notion of building this farm in, in the oldest school building in the Bronx, in the least likely place to do it. But along the way, I realized that if school didn't perform, the school would be closed and I'd be thrown the hell out. So I better figure out how to keep that school open. And I have a wonderful principal who I'm blessed to be work with and gave me enough flexibility so long as I played by the rules and delivered, which I was willing to do. And, you know, we've, we've turned that school around and not by my standards and not by his standards, but by state standards. Realize that school was undeveloped and underperforming in all 10 performance indicators by the state education department. We are now, you know, proficient and well-developed in all of them. Our state test scores are off the hook. You know, we saw a 45% increase in, in test scores. We had a huge jump in attendance. Everyone benefits when our kids come to school. We're seeing better teacher retention, better teacher satisfaction, better parent engagement. All those things lead to happier, healthier, higher performing, more resilient communities where they're needed most. So it has really been a whole school movement. And of course, you know, to go on and write a book that became the number one bestseller, The Power of a Plant, uh, that was used by school systems all across America, including my very own beloved New York City Department of Education, and has helped fund the movement and fund the program. It's kind of put us on a scale of sustainability and, 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 and self-support. That means, you know, we don't have to be one of those perpetually begging non-for-profit organizations. And I don't want to knock them, but... You know, that's not my goal. My goal is to not be part of that corporate industrial nonprofit complex, you know, buy today, get tomorrow, double down. No, 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 no. We want to be the ones we are waiting for. The calculus of my advocacy is not to be my brother's keeper, but to be my brother's brother. That's really who and what we want to be. You know, a community that has never, ever been invited to the table has now built their own. 
And that's what it's about. For us, that's really, really, really what it's about. So many people have gotten back off the dysfunction of communities like ours, that the most important thing we can do is put the unity back into our community and bulletproof ourselves from the onslaught and grow something greater. And that's exactly what we are doing. And what you've done is amazing. And I can only imagine what you're gonna to continue to do. I'm just getting started. I can't, what are you, do you have plans for the next three to five years? I'm Whoa, curious. <laughs> we have plans. How much time do we have left? But, you know, we are scaling. So case in point, you know, we scaled with the National Hockey League uh, and Jonathan Taves, the most valuable player in the league. And, you know, it's remarkable. Here's a guy who's a three-time Stanley Cup champion, triple gold athlete, you know, top 100 players of all time. More awards and accolades than you could ever imagine. And what did he do? He became the Chicago win of the year and the environmental athlete of the year by adopting our program. And it's not only been good for him, changed his eating habits, you know, in 60 of the formerly most marginalized schools in Chicago, we've seen Herculean changes. So we've brought together a model. We opened up the first net positive food and energy school in the world in the heart of the United Arab Emirates. I mean, you know, from Canada to Cairo, from, you know, from Doha to Dubai, we're, we're connecting with children and people around the world really to do something that really needs to be done, address food security, and as you say, go from soil to shelf, or as I say, from tower garden to your tummy, you know, <laughs> zero miles to plate. I love that, from tower garden to tummy. I might yeah. have to use that sometime. <laughs> You're always welcome to. We're going to take a short break and have a little announcement from our, um, our sponsor. But I hope it's a good one. It's Next Gen Chef. All right, I like them. Me too. I want to thank today's sponsor, NextGen Chef. NextGen Chef feeds members with the knowledge and tools that they need to create concepts with purpose and succeed. If you're listening today, they are offering a one-year subscription for any new founder that wants to participate at a special discounted rate. For more information, email team at nextgenchef.com. If you're interested in becoming a member or just a part of the community, email nextgenchef at team at nextgenchef.com. You can also follow them on Instagram at nextgenchef, as well as on LinkedIn and on Facebook. Thank you again, Next Gen Chef, for making this podcast possible. Together, we can change the future of food. So talk to me a little bit about that. Tell me a little bit about the curriculum, what it looks like, and if I'm on a, if I'm on, if I'm on a hockey team, if I'm at the school, what does that curriculum look like, and what would I be eating? So super, super. You know, it, uh, going back, I guess it was about three and a half years ago, in the middle of the afternoon, I get a call from a guy named Jonathan, who's a, who's a hockey player. And I'm like, why are they calling me about hockey? If it's the Knicks, I'm interested. I'm willing to get in shape, but you know, never played hockey in my life. Don't even know the rules. Turns out he's the most valuable player in the hockey league. The youngest captain in the league, you know, just uh, the player rep, his name is Jonathan Taves. They call him Captain Sirius, an Olympic gold athlete, triple gold. And he happened to see a special about Green Bronx Machine on indefensive food. So big shout out to Michael Pollan, holler. <laughs> and um, he saw, and Jonathan was at a stage in his career where he was really worried about his performance, his recovery time. Listen, 13 seasons in the NHL is no easy task. That is a brutal sport. I did not realize how brutal and how physical it was until I actually saw it. Now, Steve, you know what the best part of the hockey games are the fights. Well, you see those fights? They're, they're brutal. Those guys are like nuts. Um, <laughs> it, it's amazing. And Jonathan is such a cerebral guy. I mean, he's just a tremendously talented athlete. You watch him on the ice and you start understanding what he's doing out there. And like you wonder where on the evolutionary chart of men these guys are on the left and on the right. And then, you know, you get them off the ice and you're sitting there having these deep philosophical quest conversations with him. And he's really such a philanthropic, purpose driven guy. But bringing it back, he was concerned about his own performance and just his own recovery time and how he could, you know, get the most competitive edge as he was going into the later stages of his career. 
and he realized it was 100% food based. So him being the academic that he is, and let me give him credit and take my hat off and say he is a hell of an academic. He started just diving deep into anything about food, nutrition, recovery, and wound up learning about Green Bronze Machine, reaching out to me. Of course, I hung up on him. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remarkably. And it turns out, you know, I got back and we got back and we put together a program, a, a small, scalable, very affordable program that transformed 20 schools in one year. Wow. And they were 20 schools that never heard of hockey, never heard of Green Bronx Machine. This was when Chicago, the city of Chicago, was going through that great turmoil with the teachers union and Chicago public schools was in tremendous uh disarray shall we say and tremendous dysfunction there was no unity but you know here was the captain of an esteemed franchise coming together to do something great for children and it worked and guess what we did it again and it worked even better and we learned from that and now we are in 60 schools we will be expanding and most remarkably um jonathan being the absolute leader that he is is now spearheading a movement to purchase liquor stores um, with players across all leagues, buy out their licenses, their leases, so to speak, and replacing them with replicas of our classroom in the South Bronx that feature entrepreneurship, fresh food centers, um, you know, gardening centers, places of education, community, and, and function and functionality wow. in this challenge community. And he's bringing together teams and players from all leagues. And I don't know if you are aware, in a very kind of off-color, off-camera off moment, he made a comment about the Black Lives Matter movement that went viral in support of Black Lives Matter. And let's be frank, the hockey player, the hockey, the National Hockey League does not have a wealth of people of color. So in some regards, it was a bit of a risk, if you will, but it spoke to his humanitarian and, and, and real principles with which he conducts himself. And the next day, Michael, yeah, well, you're going to be killed because you're in a red and black jersey. And the next day, Michael Jordan was out wearing Jonathan's jersey in wow. public. And this thing has blown up. Just this past week, Jonathan and I were on a panel breakout session hosted by another friend of ours, Danielle Nirenberg from Food. Wow. And Danny was on, and I was on, and Jonathan was on, and Meseret Davis from the New York City Department of, of Education, include, otherwise known as Chef Mez in the private world, we were all talking about how we can make food access and food justice more commonplace in cities across America. So here's an athlete, you know, who stood nothing to gain and everything to lose by getting involved and being outspoken and has really championed communities that have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Um, and he's doing it and he's bringing so many other people into it. And again, he was named the Chicagoan of the year for his yeah. work with Green Bronx Machine, our humble little organization. So go figure. And at the heart of this is curriculum. And what our curriculum does is take the art and science of growing vegetables and translate it into daily lessons, reading, writing, math, science, inquiry, internet, art, project-based learning, entrepreneurship and provides a copious amount of food all year long, regardless of season, regardless of space, super energy efficient, super water efficient. It's been game changing. Wow. I, I'm I've got amazing. no energy I'm, about this. Can you tell? <laughs> None whatsoever. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm kind of neutral about the whole thing. Totally. It's very flat, Steve. I think yeah. we need to re-record. All right. Well, I've, there's probably a plant I could get my hands on that will change my attitude. Well, maybe we'll if you turn around and you tell us a little bit about what's behind you. So right that might behind, inspire you. Okay. Well, right behind me is my home tower garden. Realize I'm 12 stories up here in the Boogie Down BX, where we are screaming education, not asphyxiation. And literally when schools closed down, you know, I brought a whole farm and put it in my living room to feed my building and feed my community. But since, you know, we've gone back to school, we put some tower gardens elsewhere. But this is proof that you can have whole foods in your living room. And that's exactly what I'm doing. And, you know, and from this very tiny corner of the globe at this kitchen table right here in my humble little apartment in the Bronx, you know, I've been able to hold school all summer long. We've touched thousands upon thousands of students in tens of nations and dozens of states. 
by teaching them about growing food at home and realize kitchen tables are the new classrooms, homes are the new schools, and food is the new language which we all need to speak about. And parents, if you're looking for a job for your kid in a safe manner, here's one right for you. So we are really making farming sexy and making healthy eating sexy and bringing it back to COVID. Let's be real. The best way to increase to improve your immunity is to consume copious amounts of fresh fruits and vegetables. And I've been working daily in you know, the absolute epicenter of the virus for the five highest zip code by infection rates in New York City or where I live, work and play. And I remained COVID free largely because I believe the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables I consume, and also because I'm digging in the soil and getting a lot of microbial uh, exposure. So farming is the new sexy. You can do it safe. You can do it socially distant. And you can feed your family and feed your community and help end this virus all at the same time. I even started a garden on my terrace. Good for you. What are you growing? Uh, I'm growing a bunch of herbs. I did just get some uh, lettuce. I got some kale. I got some cilantro. I, I get a lot cilantro. of the herbs and stuff that I like to eat a lot. Good, good for you. Listen, it all starts with something. And the more we can very pull carbon right out, now, put oxygen back in, bueno. Bueno. So, so I'm curious, though, about some of your students and the impact it's had on them and how exciting this must be for them. Can you share some of the stories with your, oh. about your students and the so which, had on which them? one? You know, we've I got don't know. Choose one or two, maybe. So I'm, so I'm very, uh, you know, it was very touching on the night of our world premiere of the documentary Generation Growth to get in touch with students who I had in the 80s, who many teachers had written off. So wait, hold on, Steve, before you tell us the story, maybe introduce the documentary so people have a little background and then tell us the story. What do you think? Okay, fine. Uh, I'm easy. I follow okay. direction well. So <laughs> just about, so people have a little context. Super. About two and a half years ago, we were approached by Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield who, by the way, saw our episode called Growing a Greener World, episode 808. And Joe Lampel's a guy you should look up. Again, Growing a Greener World, episode 808 on TV. And that episode, remarkably, featuring our program in the South Bronx, went on to win an Emmy Award. Ooh. So, you know, yes, the first Emmy Award in New York City Department of Education, remarkably, for Growing a Greener World. Where else? Right in the middle of the hood, yo. So it goes <laughs> to show you anything can happen. And remarkably, Anthem was looking at our outcomes with children around social determinants of health. And they started digging deeper. And, you know, fast forward, Anthem brought our program across America. You know, the largest, blue, the largest Medicaid provider from marginalized communities realized there was an academic and behavioral benefit to what we were doing. And along the way, bringing us to dozens of schools across America, urban and rural, and some of the most diverse places you can imagine. We were in Appalachia, in the middle of Indiana. I was in a town that only had a population of 400. You know, when I met you, I met you with 400 other people on a receiving line. This was the whole town. So, you know, we were in the middle of nowhere, but it's absolutely somewhere to the people who live there. <coughs> Long made short, in the process, they made a follow documentary highlighting the e efficacy and what would happen if people across America, you know, got involved with Green Bronze Machine. And part of it, you know, people have always said it's been a cult of me or a cult of Steve Ritz. And I've said, no, it's a cult of we and it's a cult of pedagogy. It's about quality teaching and quality learning and giving teachers and students tools and enabling them to success. And, and lo and behold, the documentary was evidence of that. You know, in school after school, community after community, place after place, when you give people the ability to grow food for themselves and make a healthier choice, they opt in, an amazing shiznit happens, Justine. <laughs> Lives change, things get better, schools perform better, children eat healthier, diabetes goes down, community goes up, people want to come together. So two weeks ago, we had this remarkable online world premiere brought to, uh, brought to the nation by the Macquarie Foundation Group. God bless them and thank them very much. And we certainly appreciate it. And, we were able to connect with students of mine from the 80s. 
um, students who, you know, back then were really marginalized and written off. There was one in particular who they were trying to throw out of school. And I kind of extended myself in an interesting and innovative way, mindful that I would ask that someone would do the same thing for my child. <laughs> and lo and behold, that young man who never, who came from a family where no one had even graduated high school, not only went on to a distinguished US military career, but now runs logistics for one of the largest um, American-based firms in the nation. And his children have gone on, gone on to be tremendous successes as well. Doctor and entrepreneur, um, you know, doing amazing things. And then we had our younger students, our fourth and fifth graders, our steminist feminists who got up in there and realized that Mr. Ritz has really tricked them into reading and writing better by growing vegetables. One of the things that we're doing with the children in school is we grow food for recovering cancer patients. So our children are going growing highly prescriptive uh, leafy greens and microgreens and certain kinds of vegetables that recovering cancer patients who are both food insecure and living in public housing have neither the money nor the access to afford if it were there. And we're growing a healthier community and high performing students. And along the way, we have vegan students, vegetarians, environmental justice advocates, children and young girls who want to go to college and people who are boycotting Wendy's and know that the clown, the king and the colonel are not the places of equity, but you know, and, are really growing food with us, are involved, have helped us distribute over 100,000 pounds of food this summer. Came out in socially distanced garden, help us build gardens. We're turning our local gardens into internet hotspots. So you don't need to go to Starbucks and have an expensive cup of coffee. And there's nothing wrong with Starbucks, but I'd rather children get outside, get some fresh air, stay distant and have access to the internet, you know, in a, in a place that's better for them and the environment and provides them with healthy, fresh food in the process. Mm -hmm. So game on. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's amazing. Wonder yeah. You are doing so many positive things in the world. I can only hope to achieve a portion of that. Well, you know, listen, <laughs> you do one thing and you do it well and you get better. I, I, I have a couple of, you know, kind of golden rules. Number one, do something today that your future self will thank you for. Um, the degree to which we resist injustice is the degree to which we are free. You don't have to be great to start. Lord knows I am not great yet, but you have to start in order to be great. I and, agree. The opposite, and the opposite of courage is not cowardice. The opposite of courage is conformity because even a dead fish can go with the flow. So don't be a dead fish, swim, <laughs> swim, swim. I agree. I do try every day to have a positive impact in the world. It makes me feel, but I only feel, you know, everybody says you go to, people go to work, right? I feel inspired doing what I'm doing. That's what gets me up in the morning. You this and me both. keeps me going. I right. feel energized. I feel positive about it. It keeps me happy. So that's how I know I'm doing a good thing. Right. I've never felt better. I like to say, despite a bald spot, I've never looked better. I've never had more energy. I, I think you know me. I'm always filled with energy and excitement. I'm up about 18, 19 hours a day between here and the work that I wow. do over the time differences. So uh, it's crazy. But I'm blessed to be in the right place at the right time with people who want to make a difference in the world. And that's what makes a difference, surrounding yourself with quality people and not being afraid to fail. Listen, Formula 409 is called Formula 409 because the first 408 iterations did not work. <laughs> that's why it's called Formula 409. So I am far from perfect. I am a work in progress, but I will not let good get in the way of great. And I believe we are growing something greater. And it starts with us. It starts with me. If not us, who? If not now, when? I couldn't agree more. So with that said, and I just saw you as you raised yourself up, it said sustainable gangster. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. So I am the world's number one sustainable gangster. You can purchase this shirt for a mere $25. It is sustainably made. It is and manufactured by women at living wage. And when you purchase this shirt, a, a, a local family in need gets a bag of healthy, fresh groceries. You can also get our education, not asphyxiation t-shirt. 
And that provides a local child with a backpack full of school supplies and groceries to take home for a weekend. Or you can buy a copy of my book. Hold on, let me go get it for you. <laughs> it is called The Power of a Plant. It's a number one bestseller. Please don't buy it on Amazon because Amazon sells it for less than I can buy it for. So please buy it from the Green Bronze Machine website. 100%, let me repeat that, 100% of all proceeds go to support the program. And with that, we've been hiring parents out of public housing to work in public schools because America needs public schools in health, wellness, and nutrition programming. And go see the trailer. The trailer's called uh, uh, Generation Growth. It's on the Green Bronx Machine website, www.greenbronxmachine.org forward slash generation growth forward slash or just look it up. It's earning accolades around the country. We still have to figure out distribution, but I couldn't be more proud of the children featured. I couldn't be more grateful to Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield Medicaid for providing the funding for it and for sponsoring scores of schools across America. But most importantly, I couldn't be more proud of those adorable children who are featured in it and the teachers who work to change lives, because there's one thing that I've always said, teachers change lives. And behind every successful child, there is a mentor, a teacher, an auntie, an uncle, someone who is there in loco parentis helping to raise these children. But the most important food school supply in the world is food. And this movie gets to the heart of that, that good food and hood food and hood food and good food can go together to create a force multiplier in public education. And that's what we see time in and time again. Food awesome. and is racial before, justice. Before no justice, no peace. Go ahead. I have one question for you before we, uh, before we end our uh, talk here. So you, you said you've been doing this for decades, even though I look at you and I'm like, I don't think that's possible, but you've been doing this for decades, baby. I know, I know. I can't believe I've been doing this for decades too, but. You look marvelous. Oh, thank you. Well, our listeners can't hear us, but on the YouTube video, they can, they can see us. But question for you, you said you've been doing this for a long time. So you've had students come through over years. You've worked with teachers for years. So imagining that you've seen these kids grow up and now become adults and go out into the world. Can you share with us somebody that's gone through the program that's now an adult and off into the world and the impact it's had and- Sure, we've got management up at Whole Foods. We've got awesome. kids working at greenhouses in Gotham Greens. Remember Virage? You know, look at how big Gotham Greens has become. So if you can't grow it yourself and you're in New York City, eat some Gotham Greens, yo. They are locally grown, you know, as local and as delicious as you can get. Wow. I've awesome. got children who are teachers, police off. It, it, it's just been remarkable. You know, uh, two summers ago, I was hospitalized and I'm looking up and some kid is looking at me, goes, yo, Mr. Ritz, do you remember me? And I look up and there's a bald guy with a beard. <laughs> He goes, it's me, Kenny James from fifth grade. And then was had a heart attack because I remember <laughs> Kenny James from fifth grade sitting in the back of the classroom, picking his nose and eating it. Um, he goes, you were my favorite teacher. You know, so I'm like, that's great, Kenny, please. Did you wash before you touched me? Um, <laughs> it's just amazing stories, time in and, and, and time again. And I'm just grateful and humbled to be a part of this movement. You know, um, the kids keep coming to school and I keep meeting them there daily and they are filled with both resilience and gratitude and faith and courage. And I just want to take a moment to thank the parents and teachers who trust me with their children and, and me with, with their careers on a daily basis. And thank you for believing in me many years ago and staying in touch. And I wanna thank the movement because the good food movement is about a good world movement. Food justice is racial justice, is planetary justice. And those are the essential ingredients for a just and humane world that put the human back into being. And that's what this is all about. To eat well, live well, and create a better, brighter planet for all of us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve, for joining me here today. Thank you to our listeners. Uh, if you like this podcast, please subscribe, download us. We're on iTunes and iHeartRadio and all the regular channels. You can find us under Essential Ingredients. Download, subscribe, leave a review if you like what you hear. We're here every week. 
Thank you again, Steve. Thank you to our listeners. And Thank you. Please. God bless you. And remember, you are what you eat. So eat healthy and vote with your fork, your mouth, mouth and at the ballot today, please, dear God. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye. I want to thank my guests and my listeners for joining me today at Essential Ingredients. If you like this episode and you want to make sure not to miss any others, please subscribe. You can find us on all the large channels, including iTunes. And I hope that you'll make sure to follow us and share it with your friends. For more information about Essential Ingredients, you can check out the website justinereichman.com. You can follow myself on Instagram and Facebook at Justine Reichman. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Next Gen Chef and the platform that powers this podcast, you can find us at nextgenchef.com on Instagram, Facebook, and all the other social media outlets. I hope to hear from you and see you again soon.